There we go. Uh, yes, yeah, so don't expect soccer uh, things from me. Because I, n I never learned. All right. all right, all set. So welcome, thank you for having me. I cannot see everyone, but hopefully you can see me. I'm going to stand next to the podium so you can actually see me. Yeah. This is the first time that I found out I'm short, so be nice with me. Anyways, this is a really complicated title, Tame Schema at Scale, a Modular Approach to GraphQL. So before we get into the nitty-gritty of what is this, let's just, this is me. This is the Tinder picture, in any case. Uh, that's my name. So my name is, it's really complicated, it's Germán Frigerio. No one can pronounce that. So someone came up with Gago, and well, that's how you can call me. Uh, I'm a staff software engineer at Coursera. I, I'm part of the developer experience team there, and I'm from Argentina, as so my accent is that, in case you were wondering, and I live in San Francisco. So for any one of you that doesn't know what Coursera is, we envision a world where anyone, anywhere, can transform their lives by accessing the best uh, learning experience. So if you are interested or you think that is a good product, just come talk to me. Or if you don't like it, come, t come talk to me. Let me convince you that is great. All right. So taming, uh, uh, taming schemas at scale. Why am I here talking to you about this? So as I said, a developer experience team at Coursera takes care of making developers happy and proactive. And GraphQL is a big chunk of that. Every, every front-end engineer loves it. Backends engineers are not there yet sometimes. Uh, and we had to make sure that is not a thing. We needed everyone to be 100% on, everybody enjoying the process. Because GraphQL doesn't, doesn't it, just, it just changes how you develop software in general. So when we had to start uh, building these uh, servers, we we, we wanted to deal with one particular scenario that keeps happening in any code base. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just share with you the scenario so all of us can compare that scenario with every solution that we're going to try to find and see if it, if it holds water or not. So let's say team A puts in this new server uh, an interface user. And they right away implement that interface as a learner. You know, Coursera. So all the examples are related to learner, author, and so forth. So then, once the team A got productive and it has an amazing project, team B got jealous. So they wanted to be on. And they said, all right, let me reuse what you built. So I'm going to implement author out of this user interface. So far, so good. Two teams, a server, nothing crazy. And then team C said, hey, I'm building a product, and the only thing missing for me to power up my app is just one field in the author type. So let me add that, and I can use this server. So this is a really tiny example, so we can just iterate and talk about it a lot. So the idea here is this is the schema for you guys to, to look at. You, know, you have the, the, the user interface. You have the learner uh, implementing the user, the author implementing user, and finally, the author uh, being extended, author type being extended, and the title. So this is the question that we were trying to answer. How do we know who should review Team C changes? It's a server. Everybody put the code there. Who, who, who owns this? Everybody? Someone? No one? This is a really confusing process. So now that we're here with this tiny, tiny example, and everybody here knows, like, if we have three teams, pretty much they're in the same room. So <laughs> they can just stand up and ask. But if this grows, and just follow me with this, let's say now we scale. Let's say we have 1,000 microservices. Coursera, for context, has a lot of uh, places where we have data. And these microservices are uh, how we get it. Get it. So we, we can call them microservices. This is comparable to data sources in GraphQL. So it's where data comes from. So we have, let's say, more than 1,000. And we are in a really successful company. So this company grows 100% every year. So our team probably duplicates every year. Uh, and because it's a great company, they let you move and change teams. So to today, I'm in mobile. And tomorrow, I want to be a web front end developer. And they will let me do that. And then I want to go back. And I am allowed to go back. 
So as you can, I, the mess is getting, it, it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. We don't know who's going to review what. It's such a confusing reality. So the problems uh, that come with scaling are ownership. We don't know who owns what. Uh, and we don't understand how people uh, is, is going to help us with this. Maintainability. Who is responsible to change these types, to control them, uh, to, to say, no, don't add this field to this type. Add, it, uh, add a different type. Uh, discoverability. Who, how do we know how to find things? Maybe we have, uh, like we saw Boyager, and just we tried to investigate the schema, but no one has really ownership on what we are doing, so we really don't know how to find things. And finishing up this, uh, this set of problems, we're just going to add a new one that is a new hires ramp up time. I'm a developer experience team. We have to make people uh, productive. Imagine if we onboarded this uh, the double the team, how do we onboard that people? How do we explain, here's the schema, here are the resolvers, you get to maintain this, you get to change that, and if someone calls you, you have to review this. There's no way, there's no possible way. So this is, was Coursera in 2018. We were, we were this, a company that, that was a unicorn, how they in San Francisco likes to call, call companies, and we had no way to solve all these problems when we start scaling. So we are double or triple the people that we had, and we had no way to understand how we will do things. So just to give you just some context and how we will deal with this, it's exactly what you thought. So let, let's explain that. Every, I, I see laughs, and I see, like, probably you do this every day. You see something that is disgusting, and you want to get blame, and you find yourself. <laughs> huh? Huh. It, it. So, so let's say, let's say the, the company is really, really big, right? Let's say that you do get blame, and you find a name. And I don't know if you're religious or not. But I'm going to say that, that if you're not, you become religious right there. You start praying. You say, please, this be, please let this person be in the company still. <laughs> right? um, so after, the, after the, the, that incident, and let's say you failed horribly, like no one knows, you, the only thing that you're left of is trying to remember what is the employee in the company that has remained the most, the, the, the most time in the company, to, to find, say, do you know who should own this? It's like, I remember this person before, and so you started this coverage hunt to find the, whole, the, the, the holy person that can advise you to actually review the code. This is just your day-to-day. -day. Let's not forget that you do this a lot. You review a lot of code. You push a lot of code. So that's one of the, the ways. And the other one that everybody loves is documentation on code. We, we are great. To do, and you put your name there. Let's say, one day I'm going to come back to you. Uh, but, Maybe you can put ownership, and you put a, 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 a JS doc, because we, I, we are a TypeScript company, uh, mostly, and you say, this is maintained by this team or by this person. But it's a funny fact. No one that is leaving a company or leaving a team says, let me, before I leave, le let me go to all the comments that I wrote, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put who, who should, not, no one does that. So, so this is really that we had. This is how people was investigating. So imagine how much time you wasted just trying to find how to do your job every day. So we, we, we decided to, to, to solve this in 2019, or at least find a way. So this, this is the statement, and I, 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 will, I will ask you to, to, to go with me and remember the, 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 bold letter, the bold words in this statement that says, build a unified schema that's easy to maintain, can scale with clear ownership. So this is, th this maintain, scale, ownership are, are the, key, the key objectives that we were trying to do. So we're going to try to do through approaches to see if these approaches solve the problem or not, and if we actually found the solution. So let's do uh, approach one, the monolith. Everybody has seen this. If you go to Apollo and you, or, or GraphQL uh, org and you try to build a server, that's what you get. you get. You get that single server, that schema in the same place. That's the most common GraphQL server that we are able to, to build when we are learning. So I, I did this graph myself, so hopefully you're not discussed by them. So, the, so microservices, remember, um, Coursera uses microservices as data sources. We have GraphQL in the middle and all the clients. So far, so good. So let's see, let's see if this approach is, so we were trying to see is implementing a single data graph, splitting the schema into different files, documenting ownership via descriptions. You know, every type has a place that you can describe things. But this is really close to adding to do and comments on your code. It's 
kind of the same. No one goes back and changes them uh, uh, because they are moving. So th the pros are nothing new to learn there. Everybody can onboard really fast. We, we are onboarding people, remember that. Uh, you, you can expose the unified schema. It's always all the types are in, in one server. And, and the cons is you cannot manage that. And when, as the team grows, you start having conflicts. Everybody st start editing the same files. Everybody start not being able to merge the changes. So this doesn't work to solve our problem. So let's move on. So we have federation. I think we ha there has been a lot of talk about federation and how to, how to use it and how cool it is. And it's kind of magnificent. So let's see how it will look like in, in a Coursera context. Uh, we have the clients, the gateway. The gateway is this tiny layer that is the, the, the one responsible for coordinating different GraphQL servers and merging this schema. And then we have the GraphQL server, the GraphQL server, and all the, so we can have many, many GraphQL servers. So this sounds kind of ideal, right? Sounds like, oh, well, well we, uh, we have a dedicated server for per, per teams, the schema can be split by ownership. So if that team is owned by, by uh, let's say, team A or growth, team growth at Coursera, that's fine. They can do whatever they want in that server. As long as they expose a uh, schema and can talk to the gateway, we're fine. Um, the problem here, uh, it was a contextual problem. We don't have that many people that can maintain a, a, a gateway. So it's all beautiful, but expertise is important to have production-ready systems. This is not like you don't simply go into a, a company and say, we're going to put just servers in production if it fail, fails, and we, we apologize to the clients. We, can, we cannot do that. So uh, the company the didn't want us to build this because now teams will have to maintain their own infrastructure. So imagine your happy team that now not only has to develop the product, now it's going to start, has to be on call every day to maintain this server. It's kind of uh, cumbersome. So, Sadly, we couldn't go for federation. We wanted to because it will solve almost all the problems, but we couldn't. We didn't have the expertise. So we are going to modular. I don't know how many people here and, uh, have used any other lang any language, but any language today has modules, right? So you have a function, another function, and you can combine them, and you get something that works. All right. So GraphQL has the same ability. You can modularize schemas. You can modularize resolvers. You can make you you can make it like you have a language now. So there's a particular package that's called GraphQL modules. That is the blue icon that you see that says GraphQL modules. And, uh, and this is a way of kind of merging both uh, strategies, a single server, at the same time, enough uh, mobility for people to do whatever they want without uh, having conflicts. So GraphQL modules give us that. So we're going to see where are the benefits. So, what a modular, like GraphQL module lets you do is lets you separate your backend implementation to small, reusable, easy to implement, and easy to test pieces. Uh, that this, that we, I am already spoiled, it says that is great. So uh, you can split the schema, it exposes unified, uh, unified schema as well, and modules are log uh, location agnostic. This is, this is the key, this is the key here. And the cons is, uh, it doesn't offer you how to organize the server. I don't know if you have noticed, but we have been talking about GraphQL spec. GraphQL parsers. Everything is GraphQL federation. Everybody, how we uh, speed up things, how do we build products. No one has talked about how we organize things. And it's an important part, and it's the thing that slows you down. How you organize a server, so you don't have to be refactoring every week because you hate yourself when you put that thing there. So uh, we are going to try to tackle that in, in the six minutes that I have. So let's see the structure that we come up with. So if you follow me, it says team spaces. This team spaces. Um, the, this team spaces that you see here, it's our way to say every team is going to have a directory that they own inside the server, and that team only develops in that, in that module, in that particular directory. We said that GraphQL modules are agnostic, right? So location agnostic. So we can do whatever we want here. So team A could be in the concept of Coursera growth. It could be uh, in a learner or, or the, the, the learner experience at Coursera. So, and then the structure here is quite simple. We had pretty much we have pretty much two directories. One that is the schema inside that that team module, and the other thing that we have is types. We have been talking about types forever, so imagine what goes there. Uh, so this is kind of the structure. It's simple. The idea is that no one has to have a, a, a lot of ramp up to understand how it works, right? 
So when we organize this, we can say, call it a day, everybody shake your hands, so we just, that's it, we did it. No, <laughs> it is not that simple. So when we organize things that way, we start having problems with tooling. We start having many problems, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe really quick what, uh, what were the, the biggest caveats and how we solve them. So the first one is, how do we allow ownership changes? So far, it doesn't, it doesn't look that, that incredible. It's just directories drop there. So we had to build tooling for it. So remember this. Remember this, this kind of diagram and how we construct it? Now we ch I changed the names because the company, maybe happened to you, went to a reorg. So one day, product be, uh, I, I walk in and said, we need to change everything, how everybody works. And now you are calling like animals instead of teams. So now we are gorillas, pandas, and foxes. That's pretty much what happened. This, this is a true story that I'm not, I'm joking, but I'm not. So, but I'm not. Uh, so let me, show you, let me show you what happens with the system that we wrote. Hopefully you can see uh, what is going on. So as you can see, this is my computer. This is my, so what I'm doing here is I want to change the name of the, of the teams, right? So we're going to say now, I want team A to be gorillas. Like that. They come, they talk to no one, no one has to know, they don't have to ask anyone why they wanted to change it. Pandas and foxes. Like that. And that's it. That's how they change, like how everything works. So now everything is failing. This is the part where we merge all the, mo the modules. Now everything is failing. And imagine a developer trying to figure this out. It will be really, really, really complicated. So we, I'm spending my sweet time here. So. Uh, we, decide, we decided to say, why don't we just generate for you the entire code that you're not supposed to touch? So everything is failing, right? Because the modules are disconnected now. So you see that, that that's the file that we were looking at. And when, uh, when we just created a, a tool that's, that you, we call that is yarn generate, and we just hit it, and it will refactor for us the entire file system. So that, that file that I'm showing, uh, showing to you, it's not a file that we, and now everything works again. That file, we're not committing that file. That file is self-generated on the server when we build the server. So all the packages can have enough freedom for every team to develop at their own velocity and be comfortable and stop worrying about how to do their job every day. So how do we do, how do, we do linting? I want to skip over this, but linting, linting is always assuming that you have the entire schema. You don't have chunks of schema, so you have to understand what rules apply to the entire schema and what rules can be applied to a single file. So moving on. Uh, so how do we avoid uh, type duplication across the team, across teams? Uh, so type generation from schema and test script is uh, what we did, but with, a, with a, one, one more loop on it. So remember this? What we did is, uh, what we did is, this is the, the author, right? This is the author, and then this is the type that we export, and GraphQL by itself, GraphQL modules and the generators will give you the entire type that exists. So all the extensions uh, and so forth. But we, with a GraphQL code generator, we uh, took that and we even narrowed down the, the, the type. So it's exactly what you have in your module. So you cannot add the title that the other team was adding. So it will not let you. So there's no way they can, they can step on each other's toes while they're developing fast. They even, that's my EDE just telling me that, that I can't, right? So now we have protection from people to, to, to just have conflicts between each other. And furthermore, if I can just understand how to use my computer, there you are. Furthermore, oh, so, and we have the last one. I have a minute at 33, uh, a minute, and I would like to show this because this is like I actually show you my computer and try to do something. So hopefully we can do it. I'm going to try to take a minute here. So, la la la. So we, we added documentation. So this is a problem that we were talking about before. Um, we, were saying, we were saying that how do we know how to explore the schema. How do we know that a team extended another, team, another type from a different team? Now that you saw this layout, how do we do that? So the teams, have, all the directories have names, and we know where things are now. Everything is really, it's automatic and organized. So we just attach descriptions to every type when we parse the schema, 
and we are the exact location where that, that field is declared. Let me see if I can find a way of showing this. We, have, uh, we, we open the, um, the playground, right? Let me move the weapon the play playground. And if we go to the docs over here, right? And you see learner and author, right? Let me zoom in so you don't have to hate me because you cannot see. So we say learner and author. If we go to author, you see this? This has been extended from original type. And you can click on it, and you, it will take you to where it should take you. But let's see something more complicated. What about title? Remember title was team C, the last team? All right. So what happens if I just click title here? It's, oh, so now it says team X because we changed the directory, right? So if I click here, sorry, oh. it's, all, I, it, it's always the same thing, right? Let me see. Give me a second. Oh, it's taking me, but you cannot see it. Let me get to my, my computer. Um, whoop, oh. There you go. So when I click on it, it just takes me directly to the, to the type, right? So every developer, every developer, when they click on that, they can explore the schema and just go directly to the file where it was extended specifically. So this simplifies how the entire team works. And now no one is stepping on each other's uh, toes. And what is better is now they can have independence, right? So going back to, going back to, to wrap up. Oh. It's really hard. There you go. Wrapping up here, if you didn't understand anything and all this was just confusing with my accent and all, Something that I want you to remember are three things. If you modularize the GraphQL schemas, ownership and maintainability are possible, and you can do it. As you saw, we solved every problem that we had about sharing code, about getting to the right definition, about people having independence, about people not worrying about things that are not important. Federation is still an option. This is, as the team grows, we need to get to federation in some point. This is a good solution, but it's never going to hold as long as what Federation will do for us. So this doesn't change anything for Federation. We can just cut these directories, create another server, paste them directly, and the server will work again, because we have all the generation tool that we need to make the system work. And finally, uh, all the things that you saw, it's generating code using, uh, using what uh, Ivan wrote on GraphQL, uh, GraphQL JS, just to parse the schema. and squeeze the schema as much as we can to get information out of it. And we create types, and it's how we, how we make the developers just work and not worry about finding people, not worry about how to be productive, and most of all, enjoy the everyday and, and just be happy. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to GraphQL, John Wong, uh, Mandeep Sai, and uh, Lachlan for helping me with the talk. <laughs>